Good morning, Grace Point. Mid morning. How are you guys doing? We're we're sparse today, so I need some I need somebody to say good morning real loud. Good morning. Hey, there we go. <laughs> uh, would you guys stand and worship with us today?
that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to air and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my
I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay in my head Barrels of a good
so good to us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Just take a moment and speak out your thankfulness to God. Just take that moment and say thank you, Jesus, in your heart or out loud, however you'd like to do it this morning. Let's say thank you. Thank you for your goodness. First time ever I see one hand. We've got a little connection cards we want to give you. We won't hunt you down, we promise. There's one over here too. It'll be great. Right here, this gentleman. If you could raise your hands one more time. There we go. Yeah. Thank you. It's good to have you. Welcome. Special welcome to you guys this morning. So for the rest of us, we are going to say welcome in a moment. But for the kids that are still in here, you are dismissed to Kids Church. So have a great time. So for our visitors, you're welcome to stay seated. The rest of you, let's stand up for a moment. Say hi to somebody you haven't said hi to for a while and also welcome our visitors, if you would. Just take a few moments to do that. Thank you. 
Alrighty then. Come on back to your seats, everyone. I know it's hard to break up good fellowship. But it's time to make announcements. The favorite thing of everyone here, I know. You live for announcements in this church, right? Not. But it is announcement time. So in case you haven't seen the news, can you guess what's happening tomorrow? I'm prepared. It's the eclipse tomorrow, in case you missed it. So the height of it will be at 1.58 p.m. tomorrow. So if you've got some funky glasses like this, go on outside and see a wonderful work of creation. So, all right, we begin back with worship, watch, and wait. So, this is correctly here. Um, worship, watch, and wait is tonight. If, for those who don't know what that is, that's Daniel Brimer who leads that. It starts at 6 o'clock to about 7, 7.15, 7 7.30. It's a wonderful time of worship, very powerful time right here in the sanctuary. So I invite you to come out for that. It's a great, great time. On this coming um, Thursday, this uh, Friday, the uh, 11th, no, Thursday, 7 p.m. in the dining room is lift. I thought it was Thursday. It's Ladies Intentional Fellowship time. And there's Jessica Wave High back there, Jessica. Jessica leads that on Thursday night. Friday. A wonderful Friday. It was Friday. All right. It has down here the 12th. That's what was confusing me. So it is Friday. You're right. Friday is the 12th. I'm all backwards. So Friday is the 12th. That's right. I should know that, but anyway. Though that we have the latest intentional fellowship night in the dining hall, and that's at 7 p.m. That has been awesome, I hear. Saturday morning, that date I got right, is our men's breakfast at 8 o'clock. So you men, if you haven't been a part of that yet, come. It's an amazing time. A fellowship, some good food, everyone brings some breakfast, and some really good time led by our very own Dan Manis. We also want to say a big thank you to those that have been part of the Easter egg, Easter egg hunt last weekend, Easter volunteering in some way or another. Thank you so much. I think this room was one of the fullest I've ever seen. If you came early, you might have seen some of the slides. We'll be showing them later on as well from that time. That was an amazing, amazing time. So Brett and Gulnara are here to share about the marriage seminar. Thank you, thank you. So, um, you know me, my name is Brett. This is my lovely wife, Gilmara. And we wanted to share about an upcoming uh, marriage seminar that's coming in May, May 17th and 18th. And um, we have, I wanted to give a little testimony this morning. So we're gonna, I'm gonna hand it over to my wife and she's gonna talk a little bit about uh, marriage seminars and the art of marriage. Good morning. So my name is Gilmara, and um, we have been married for 22 years now. And um, I uh, just wanted to share a very quick testimony that whether you're newlywed or you're a long time married, those kind of events are very good for your marriage. And the thing was like when we first married, I always was considering like my marriage was great. Um, but that, like we were newlywed and we went to this particular seminar and it was so helpful for us because we were like, oh, I didn't know you think this when I do that. <laughs> um, and then when we went to Art of Marriage, that was like we were already married for a long time and that particular seminar was like a fresh one for me and for Brett. Um, and it was just such a refreshment for us. So I just wanted to say that this seminar, this Art of Marriage will be good for whether you're newlywed or engaged, or you've been married for a long time, it will be really good for you. And I just wanted to add into that, um, when we went through the art of marriage, even 12 years into our marriage, uh, we realized that we were just discovering some new things about each other. We're like, you know, you can be married 12 years, and, and now we're married over 20 years, and I feel like I'm still discovering new things about my wife, and I hope she's discovering things about me. <laughs> so. Um, I want to give you a little bit of, of what the format will be like, just so you understand how this will go. But um, the format, it's called a seminar, but it's, it's not like you just sit and get teaching. So that's not the way the format is. There are uh, Family Life uh, Ministries put together some wonderful videos 
There's some wonderful people who have some great wisdom to share, but then the couples will go off on their own and they'll sit at a table and we have some prepared questions for you and you'll talk about what you saw on the video through the questions and it's a great time for you to discover each other. So the format is more of a seminar workshop-ish kind of thing, okay? So it's, uh, it's a great way to just get to know each other. Um, also, so we have this format with the videos and then the discussion times, but we also have Eric and Lisa Spady who are going to be coming in um, at the back end of the seminar, and they're going to be talking about sex and marriage, which we're excited about because we have our own Eric and Lisa Spady to do that for us. Okay? They had that as part of the um, the, their own video series, but we thought, well, we've got the real deal here. Let's let them do it. So they're going to be doing that. So um, that's just a, a plus. So registration deadline is two weeks from today, April 21st. And regist registration means you need to sign up, of course, but you also have to pay $50 um, by April 21st. And the reason is, is we need to order some material. We can't order it until we have the money. So I do want to add to that, if you're like, I don't know if I, it's $50 per couple, and if you're at that place like, I don't know if we can afford that, just come and talk to me, that's okay. We'll see what, what we can do to make it work for you, okay? There's a table just outside in the lobby, so after church, Gunnar and I will be there if you want to talk to us about Art of Marriage, or if you want to sign up, the sign-up sheet's out there. Come and talk to us. If you have, want to write a check today, $50, make it out to Grace Point Baptist Church and as part of your registration. And you can give that to me at the table or you can give that to Roseanne in the office during the week. I think I covered everything. If you have any questions, please come talk to us in the lobby after, after the service. All right. Thank you, Brent and Bernard. We're looking forward to that. So if you're a married couple engaged, come. No matter how long, how short you've been married or engaged, come. This will be really worth your time. And hey, we're going to talk about sex in the church. I want to share something personal. So Lisa, come on up. My uh, wife and I are going to be uh, leaving this Thursday. That's why it's all discombobulated about Thursday. What day of the week was it? We are going to be teaching together in Malaysia. So we have the opportunity of going there for a little over two weeks to speak in Penang. It's in a YWAM school called Restoring Relational Systems. So Lisa is going to be teaching for one week on working with parts and what goes on inside of us when we're wounded and the trauma process. I'm going to be teaching the following week on trauma, the nervous system, how to work with the body. And our goal is to really train up people to really be able to do this work, lay counselors. One of the things we're most excited about is not just the people that'll be in Penang, but we've got about 50 students online, several of them from mainland China. So we're actually gonna be tra tra translated into Chinese, so we have to talk and pause and all that good stuff. But it'll be a great opportunity to be able to reach into China, so we would appreciate your prayers. So, yeah, anything you want? Yeah. Yeah, it's an 18 hour flight from LA oh, yes. to um, Singapore. So it's one of the longest flights you can take. And I was in a car accident in December. So for me to sit for that long is a bit of a challenge. My back hasn't regained, regained its strength yet. I don't have a ton of stamina, stamina anyway. So this is a real step of faith for me. But when Jesus says go, you know, what do you say? <laughs> You're coming you know. too, right? <laughs> so. I just really appreciate the prayer specifically for that, and of course for the Holy Spirit to speak through us to these people's hearts, but it's always our hearts, hearts desire to see people healed, not just trained. When we can, we talk to people individually and um, offer free sessions, because for many, they can confide in us as an outsider much easier, and it gives them a place to, to, to talk about and process the difficult things. So it can be very demanding time-wise and with jet lag and everything. So we just really appreciate the grace and for extra strength and wisdom. Thank you. 
I'll, I'll stand behind you. All right. I'm finally your side. Well, uh, it's such a privilege to be able to send uh, Eric and Lisa out and uh, that they're here this morning to be able to pray for them. Uh, would you just join with me in prayer? Maybe reach out your hands to them and let's pray for them. Lord, we just thank you. Thank you for the privilege uh, to be able to go, the calling to go. Thank you, Lord, that you've called Eric and Lisa to, to go and uh, proclaim your truth. And so, Lord, I pray that you would use them mightily for your kingdom. Lord, I pray that you would go above and beyond their expectations. That as Lisa uh, shared, Lord, that you would bring healing through their ministry. Lord, that people would be healed and set free. Lord, that uh, you would, again, give them strength, give them supernatural wisdom. We pray for Lisa's body, Lord. We pray for healing and protection as she flies, as they travel, Lord, that there wouldn't be any residual effect from the accident, that her body would be completely healed in the name of Jesus. Yes. And so, Lord, we pray that you would go with them, you've gone before them, and you'll be their rear guard and protection. Lord, we pray against any of the attack of the enemy of their lives, Lord. Again, also we pray for financial provision for them, Lord. Pour out your resources on them to be able to go freely and bless those people that they minister to. We pray again also, Lord, for your protection for their home and for those staying behind. And we pray for a covering for their family. And we pray this all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate that. Thank you so much. All right, let's go back to that place of prayer as we take up our offering. Offering isn't just something we do, just something you have to do as a church to make the budget. Budget's important. We've actually been below our budget the last couple of months, so we're, we're hurting a little bit as a church. But most of all, offering is our act of worship. It's our act of giving back. Not that the Lord needs our money. He owns it all. But it's our act of going, God, I trust in you. You are my financial provider. We even need some finances still for our trip. We trust the Lord, right? We all need to trust the Lord. And so as a church, we do that too. So would you pray with me as we seek the Lord, as you seek the Lord for the offering this morning? Let's pray. God, I want to thank you for what you are doing in this church and through this church. Lord, even for the Easter outreach that took place last Saturday, Lord, the amazing time the kids had, the gospel presentation that was given. Lord, thank you for the work of this church. And Lord, we want to just pray that, Lord, you would truly bless and multiply this offering. Lord, would you fill in the gaps in our budget? Lord, would you help us as a church do the things that you've called us to do as we put our trust and our eyes upon you. So God, we just give it to you right now and thank you, Jesus. Amen. So on the screen, you'll see some ways to give. Ushers, go ahead and pass. On the ways, you'll see ways to give. Online's a great way to do it or as the plate goes around. And just let the Lord speak to you and minister to you as Christy and her friends sing a song for us this morning.
This morning, Lord, we thank you that uh, we can come into your presence. Thank you that the veil was torn and that we can enter into the Holy of Holies. Thank you, Lord, that we can worship you. Lord, right now we just continue. We worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Father, we worship you, the great I Am. We praise you and we give you the glory for you are holy. Holy, holy, the Lord God Almighty. And Lord, as we gather to worship, we, we want to pray for our nation. And Lord, we pray that you would bring revival to our nation, Lord, that you would turn the hearts of the leaders of our nation to you. Lord, we're in desperate times and as we look around and we see some of the attitudes and thoughts and the leadership, Lord, we pray that you would bring your glory over this nation once again, Lord. And Lord, we pray for Kansas City, Lord, what a privilege to, to be here, to be living here, but you've called us to this place to serve you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would uh, give each and every one of us a sense of your calling on our lives for the position, the place that you've placed us in. And use us for your glory, Lord, we pray. Lord, as we pray for our nation, we pray for the nation of Israel. Lord, we cry out for the salvation of Israel, for the peace of Israel. Lord, we, we don't know what to pray, but we do know that your eye is on Israel. And we ask you, Lord, for your power to be displayed in salvation power to be displayed of Israel. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for 
our church family, those in our church family that uh, are not with us uh, at the moment. And I pray for Michael Kent too, Lord, as he left this week on his deployment. And I pray, Lord, for protection for him, for covering for him. Lord, that you would uh, use him mightily wherever you send him. And Lord, I pray that as he transitions into settling down, Lord, I pray that you would give him a sense of your peace, even this morning. And Lord, we pray for his family, Lord, as they, they miss him going. And I pray, Lord, that you would be a father to them. You would you'd wrap your arms around them and bring peace to their home. Lord, for the, those in our church family that are sick this morning, we pray for healing. Lord, we pray for your power to be manifestly displayed in healing. Now, Lord, we just think of those that are, are struggling with temporary illness and those that are struggling with chronic illness. Lord, you are the healer, the great physician, and we pray for healing in the name of Jesus. So, Lord, we thank you again for the privilege we have to come and worship you, and I pray now, Lord, that as we open your word, as we look at your word, that you would speak to us, speak truth to us, Transform us by your word. Lord, we don't want to hear the thoughts and imaginations of man. We want to hear from heaven this morning. So speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And just a, a quick update. Uh, thank you all for your prayers. Uh, Debbie is uh, still in hospital. And uh, they, uh, she was admitted on Thursday. But uh, her surgery is scheduled sometime this week. We don't know. Uh, the surgeon comes back uh, tomorrow, so we'll hopefully have some answers, but thank you for your prayers uh, for her. Um, let me get this before I... For my voice, I lose it. So, don't you um, love it when God confirms His Word to you? When, when the times when God is leading you and speaking to you in one portion of the scripture and you're hearing from the Lord and he is saying something then you turn to a completely different passage and the same theme God uses God speaks to you so directly and it just seems to pop out at you over and over again every time you open God's word well that happened to me this week in my time with the Lord I've been reading through the Old Testament, I was kind of reading through the Old Testament and I read portions from the New Testament and uh, I was reading Leviticus and uh, Le reading Leviticus 19 and um, as I was meditating on the, you know, Levit Leviticus is a really fun book, a lot of interesting details and you know, if you, the more you think about it, the more you think, why? And it's, it's really interesting, but as I was reading Leviticus 19, I read the first verse, the first two verses, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Just keep that verse in mind. You'll understand why that means so much to us today. But as you know, before the Easter weekend, before uh, we looked at uh, the Palm Sunday and the triumphal, triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem and the Resurrection Sunday. Before that, we began a series going through First Peter and been looking at uh, Peter's letter to the exiles, to the church in the region. And uh, we left off three weeks ago, but the portion of the scripture that I felt the Lord that we would just so happen to be this Sunday was First Peter chapter 1, verse 13 to 16. And it would just so happen that it would be this Sunday that we would focus on that. Because listen to 1 Peter chapter 1, um, verse 13 to 16. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. The Lord is confirming his word to me through Leviticus and through First Peter, and it was set back in January. So God is speaking to us 
as a church, I believe, in this area. Again, going through 1 Peter, there is so much that we're going to learn. And 1 Peter, the theme is the Christian's hope in times of trial, joy through suffering. And we begin verse 13, and we see, therefore, so we have to recap, we have to look back and say, what is he talking about? Why is there therefore in the scriptures? And so three weeks ago, we looked at the glory of the gospel. The glory of the gospel message, the, the greatest message ever told, and the incredible privilege that we have, and it is a privilege, to be able to declare the gospel. The gospel message of salvation, the gospel message of the kingdom of heaven. So what a privilege that we have to declare that. And But more than that, sometimes, as we looked at a few weeks ago, sometimes God calls us to embody the gospel. What I mean by that is the gospel is a message of suffering leading to salvation, suffering leading to joy. There is a suffering in the gospel. There's a pain in the gospel, but it leads to salvation. And sometimes we'll be called on to go through suffering and proclaim the gospel through our lives, to embody the gospel in our lives. Because we can suffer as Christians and we can suffer well because there's a future hope. We know that God is at work. And sometimes the open book that God uses to declare the gospel is us, is our lives. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12 ends with this phrase, things into which angels long to look. I've often thought about that. What, what does that mean? Surely the angels understand the gospel. Surely the angels know the gospel. And the gospel message is something that the heavenly beings don't fully grasp. We are the recipients of the gospel. And we don't fully grasp and understand the depth and the breadth of the gospel message. But we have the privilege. The angels, the heavenly beings, long to be able to declare the gospel. But it's our privilege. It's our calling as followers of Jesus. God reveals the message to us by the Word of God through the Holy Spirit. So in the first section of the chapter, of this first chapter of, of Peter's first letter, we saw that there's a walking in hope, a walking in hope. And now the emphasis shifts and becomes a walking in holiness, a walking in holiness. Now, the two aren't disconnected. There's hope and there's holiness. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 3, we read, and everyone who thus hopes in him, in other words, who hopes in Jesus, purifies himself as he is pure. There's a call to holiness and purity that's on every believer. So let's jump into the text, verse 13. Therefore, preparing your mind for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Prepare your mind for action. Uh, the New King James or the King James Version says, gird up your loins. Now that kind of English is lost on us nowadays, but essentially it means get ready for action. Get prepared. You're about to enter into action. And, uh, you know, I love to exercise. I, I love to, to cycle and, and exercise, and, but I don't like exercising in winter because I hate the cold. And the process of getting ready for exercise is getting changed out of comfortable warm clothes into clothes that aren't that warm because you're about to get hot through exercise. And I hate the process of getting changed into cold clothes in a cold room and then beginning to exercise. So as a result, I don't exercise a lot in winter. I don't prepare my body for action. And what we're called to do here is to prepare our minds for action. Get ready for action. Ephesians 6 says, we will read about the armor of God. Ephesians 6, one of the pieces of the armor of God is the helmet of salvation. It's putting on the helmet of salvation. Well, I've often thought about what is the helmet for? Well, it protects the mind. The gospel message, the salvation message we put on, protects our minds against the lies that the enemy is constantly feeding us. So to prepare your minds for action is to put on the salvation message, to put on the gospel to protect your mind from the lies of the enemy. And then the verse goes on, be sober-minded. Be sober-minded. This is an exhortation to simply to think right. To think right. 
Be sober in your thoughts. Don't allow gossip or lust or envy or pride or fear to inhabit your mind and to, to consume your thoughts. Be sober-minded. Think about God's things. Think, so, think about things that are holy. Don't allow anything that's contrary to the truth of God's Word to rest in your mind, to dwell in your mind. Author Brian Tracy writes this, You are not what you think you are, but what you think that you are. And I'll let you dwell on that. When I shared this with my children, Christy said, Dad, you sound like Yoda. Um, <laughs> but what you think that you are. You are what you think. I, you know, what you choose to think on, what you choose to dwell on, will make or break you in your life. It'll determine what kind of person you are, determine what kind of person you'll become is what you think about. Yes, something that may come as a shock to you. You choose what to think about. Think about that. You choose what to think about. You choose what to dwell on. And what you think about affects all of your life. One of the most challenging verses in the Bible, and it's often overlooked, but it's really challenging, is Philippians 4 verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. That's why in verse 7, in the previous verse, Paul writes, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul is addressing their thinking. He's saying, what are you thinking about? Where does all our temptation come from? Where does all our troubles come from? It begins with a thought, with a concept, with an idea. We see something and it triggers a thought in our minds that leads to temptation. We hear something. We may be walking past a crowd of people and we hear something that they're saying and we take a piece of that and the enemy plants a seed in our minds and we think, well, maybe they're speaking about me and it begins to build in us and we end up bearing a grudge against them because of something we thought we heard. Our minds are the epicenter of the spiritual warfare that we face every day. Whenever we begin to believe a lie, Satan has control of us, over us in that area that we begin to believe the lie. He wants to control our thinking. He wants to corrupt our minds with lies. That's why the media and the entertainment industry is so powerful. There's a battle for the control of the minds. That's why it's imperative for us to spend time meditating, thinking on the Word of God, the truth of God's Word. I've said so many times, you know, but the truth is we live in a world with an incredible amount of information that's constantly bombarding us. We're, we have access to information nonstop, 24-7. Most people spend between 12 and 16 hours a day consuming information. And not much of it is good. We consume, take in, saturate ourselves with information. News, movies, radio, internet, TikTok, whatever it is, we're receiving information. And not all of it is good. But we get all of this, and a lot of it is lies from the enemy. We take it in, and we don't think that we need to spend time meditating and thinking on the truth of God's Word and focusing on what God is saying to us. When we neglect feeding on the Word of God, when we, when we neglect saturating ourselves with the Word of God, we find it impossible to discern between the truth and the lie. The only way we're really going to know, and the Holy Spirit is only going to really be able to prompt us to know what is truth and what is not true, is by meditating on the Word of God and allowing the Spirit of God to reveal truth to us. It is serious. It's really impossible to have a growing relationship with Jesus Christ without spending time meditating on His Word to us. Jesus is the Word. So proper actions come from proper thinking. What we think about determines our practice. What we meditate on, what we 
dwell on determines what we do. Remember I said earlier, you, you choose what to think about, right? You are choosing what to dwell on. And what you think about affects every part of your life. People are often surprised when they, when they find someone or hear about someone that's caught in some terrible sin. And they think, I never would have thought that person would have done. Well, how did they get to the point of actually pulling that trigger and killing that person? How did they get to the point of stealing that amount of money from people that they thought loved them? How did they get to the point of having an affair? How did that person get to the point to do such violence in the community? It all began with improper thinking. It all began with a thought. Just a simple thought. Verse 13 continues, Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, the hope that we have in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. That's where our hope needs to be placed. Jesus could come back today. Do we hope for that? Do we think about that? Do we dwell on that? It should be so real that it governs every decision that we make. It should be real to us that every thought and action that we have is Jesus could come back today. I don't know about you, but it's, it's usually in the hard times. It's usually in the times when there's financial struggles or health struggles, challenges that I'm thinking, man, Jesus could come back today, right? I'm looking forward to Jesus coming when things are going rough. But when things are going well, and everything seems to be plain sailing and things are going good, do I really think about the possibility that Jesus could come back today? Now be honest, some of us would say, tomorrow would be good today. Jesus, you can come back tomorrow because today I'm, I'm enjoying life right now, right? But our thinking needs to be determined, needs to be um, governed by the fact that Jesus, his imminent return could happen today. Christians should live with an expectation of seeing Jesus Christ. Warren Wiersbe wrote, A Christian who is looking for the glory of God has a greater motivation for present obedience than a Christian who ignores the Lord's return. Right? Do we have that motivation for obedience? When we center our thinking around eternity, that's right, you have to understand that we're eternal beings and we need to be thinking in light of eternity. Always. And when we do that, we're free from the things of this world. We're free, we're free from the struggles and the temporal nature of this world, the things that we go through. We don't worry about the temporal things. We don't worry so much about that new car that we're wanting to buy or that promotion or that uh, house that we want to buy, that relationship that we're hoping and doesn't seem to be working out. Our bank balances aren't that important to us anymore when we think about eternity. And we think about the possibility that Jesus could return. Set your hope fully on Jesus. And as we do that, the Bible says we experience His grace. We experience His grace over us. Grace to go through tough times. Grace to live out the gospel message. Titus chapter 2. We read this. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Are we waiting with expectation? Verse 14 continues, As obedient children do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Notice he says obedient children. He doesn't say subservient children or slaves. He says you're obedient children. There is love there. There is fully loved and obedient children that he is speaking about as children of God. Children inherit many things from their parents, right? Children inherit the characteristics and the nature and some of the habits from their parents. Walking with the Lord, our growing relationship with the Lord affects how we behave. 
affects our thinking. As we become more like Him, it affects our thought patterns, our thoughts, our decisions, and our lifestyle. Peter says, formerly you were ignorant. He doesn't say formerly you were disobedient. He says, formerly you were ignorant. You didn't know the gospel. We were simply lost and ignorant without the knowledge of the gospel, without that relationship with Jesus Christ. We gave ourselves to the pleasures of the world, hoping to find something that would bring us peace, but only brought disappointment and ultimately it brings death. So that's, that's the result of the nature that we're born with. Every one of us is born with a sin nature. Ever since Adam, every human being that's ever been born has a sin nature in them. Contrary to what sociologists will tell us today, we're not inherently good people. We're inherently sinful people. And if you want proof of that, just watch the evening news. We're not inherently good. We need our nature transformed by the gospel message. And as Christians, we're called to live differently. We're called to live with a new nature given to us by the Holy Spirit. And verse 15 says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Were it not for the, the call of God in our lives, we would still be living in sin. In ignorance, we'd be lost. But when we respond to the call of God, everything changes in our lives. When we make that decision to respond to the call of God in our lives. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is 1 Peter 2 verse 9. But you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own special, his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then verse 16 continues, Since it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. It is written. I love that phrase, it is written. If you go back to Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, how did he respond to Satan's temptation? He said, It is written, it is written, it is written. And he quoted the Old Testament every time, and Satan had to flee. The Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. And as we're praying, as we're contending for something, isn't it wonderful as you're praying for something, you can, in your prayers, say to God, it is written. It is written. Do you know the Word of God well enough to that in your prayer time to be able to say, it is written. And to take those promises of God's Word, to declare those promises back to Him. There's power in praying the Word of God. Sadly, too many Christians don't know the Word of God, so they don't know the power of praying the Word of God. Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of scoffers, nor sits in the seat, in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. In other words, his delight is in the Word of God, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all he does, he prospers. Do you delight in God's Word? Delight in the Word of God that He wrote for you? There's blessing in delighting in the Word of God. There's blessing in knowing and praying the Word of God. As we meditate on it, as we obey it, we know God's will for our lives. We know God's blessing for our lives. I'm talking about the, the whole Word of God, right? Not just the parts that we like. There's a, there's a strong move in, in certain large churches to completely disregard the Old Testament. and say, so, well, that doesn't apply to us today. There's a push to throw it out, but while we don't abide by or fall under the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament, we're still under the moral laws. When Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, He took the moral laws that we know from the Old Testament and He raised the bar. He clearly taught that wherever He went. These are more than simply rules and laws, that, but the entire Word of God is the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
It's his revelation, God's special revelation of his son. And as we read God's word, as we meditate on God's word, even through Leviticus and some of those chapters, we see the nature and character of God revealed to us. It's his word to us. And we see through that, we see that God is holy. God is holy. You know, we don't study the Bible like a textbook so that we can answer certain questions. On, we, we feed on God's word. The word is all about Jesus. And then we have that phrase, be holy for I am holy. Be holy for I am holy. As I said, this message or the beginning of this message, this phrase is found frequently in the Old Testament and in Leviticus 19, 20, Leviticus chapter 11. It's a common phrase, but what does it mean? Because when I was a new believer and I read that phrase, be holy for I am holy, I thought, how on earth could I do that? In my thinking was, that means I have to be absolutely pure and perfect because God is absolutely pure and perfect. How can I be like him? The bar is set so high. God is demanding that I be absolutely perfect. And I couldn't figure it out. I was wrestling with it. You know, holiness is part of his nature. And the word, the root word of the word holy actually comes from being set apart. It means to be set apart, to be completely separate from anything that is unclean or sinful. God cannot even look upon sin. That's why we looked at last week when we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus. On the cross, when Jesus took on all of our sin, God the Father had to look away, forsake His own Son, because He's holy. He cannot even abide sin. He had to turn away. And as believers, we're called to be holy. That means we're called to be exclusively for the use and the glory of God, not giving ourselves to anything else. The call to be holy is the call to be different, to be set apart. Now, a holy person is not an odd person. I just want to clarify that, right? As I was preparing this message, I was thinking about a number of believers that are a little odd, right? You know what I mean. If you don't know what I mean, you might be that odd person. <laughs> but to be holy is to be set apart for the glory of God. Our lifestyle, our conversation, our finances, our career choices, they're to be different. Different from someone who doesn't have a personal relationship in Jesus Christ. You're called to be holy. To, to the dedicated follower of Jesus, there's no differentiation between the sacred and the secular. It's all sacred. We're called to be holy in every aspect of our lives. All of life is holy as we live to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 30, 31 says, So with whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Everything that you do is to be holy for the glory of God. If something cannot be done for the glory of God, then we can be sure it must be outside the will of God. Do you get that? If something cannot be done for the glory of God, then it must be outside of the will of God for our lives. We're called to be holy. Recently, I've been listening to an audio book uh, written by Tony Dungy, the uh, former NFL player and coach. And uh, he's talking about the time that he was playing in the NFL. And this was way back in 1978-79. He was traded from the Pittsburgh Steelers to the San Francisco 49ers. And uh, he was a young man. And uh, the Steelers at the time was a smaller organization. And a small town, small organization nice uh, healthy community moved to san francisco much bigger organization bigger city a lot of temptation a lot of players were involved in drugs and alcohol and party scene and he had to make a decision as a committed christian he had to say well is this what i'm going to do because everybody else is doing it or am i going to be set apart am i going to live holy and he made the decision not to enter into that lifestyle, but to remain true to the values that he learned as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus. 
And so he did that. Some years later, a player who played on the same team in the 49ers with him at that time came up to him and said, Tony, I want to know, let you know you saved my life. I said, how did I save your life? He said, by your example, I realized that I didn't need to take drugs to be in the in crowd. I didn't need to do alcohol and parties in order to be part of the crowd. But by your example, you gave me permission to live differently. You saved my life. Because Tony Dungy was and is set apart. He was holy, and because he was holy, he influenced people around him. The name of the book is called Uncommon. A person who is a follower of Jesus needs to be set apart, uncommon, holy. Your holiness influences people around you. Are you walking in holiness today? You know, so this message is not intended to be one of those to beat you up and make you feel bad about all the things that you're doing wrong in your life. No, this is to encourage you to live holy. To encourage you to live to the glory of God. To live lives that are set apart. And as we live holy, the Holy Spirit leads us and informs every decision that we make. Every area of our lives, it will bring peace in our lives and it will bring glory to God. You proclaim the gospel through your life. So what area of your life is God calling you to walk in greater level of holiness today? Are you walking in holiness in your workplace, in your school, in your family? You know, it's easy to pretend to be holy on a Sunday morning. To sing the right songs, raise your hands, to be holy, to be set apart on a Sunday morning. But do we carry that into the rest of the week? Are we set apart in every area of our lives? Maybe there's an area of your life today that the Holy Spirit is pointing His finger on and saying, I want you to be holy in that part of your life. Holiness in your workplace. Holiness in your school or your college. Holiness with your entertainment. Some of us need holiness with the remote control. Holiness in your finances. Holiness in your social media postings or maybe your social media responses. Holiness in your driving. That's really meddling. Holiness in your speech. Every area of our lives, we're called to be set apart, to be holy as He is holy. And you see, this, this affects every area of our lives. The call to be holy to the glory of God. So I want to encourage you today. God is speaking to you. If there's an area of your life that you need to set apart, that you haven't, you've been saying, well, that, that, I'm not going to let God mess with that area of my life. Or I know that I'm not living holy in that area of my life. I want to encourage you today to respond to the Lord. And it might mean how you respond as the worship team closes um, our, our worship time together. We're going to have a worship a ministry team up here. I invite you to come and pray with them. But maybe the Lord is just calling you right now just to stay seated, to bow your head and to say, Lord, I give that area of my life to you. I give you that area of my life, creating me holiness. So let's pray together as the worship team comes up, as our ministry team comes up, and we respond to the Lord together. Lord, we worship you. We thank you, Father, that you are holy, holy, holy. The Lord God Almighty. Thank you that you've called us to be holy. Forgive us, Lord, for the areas of our lives and maybe the aspects of our lives that we are withholding your call for us to be holy. That we're living apart from you, living apart from your glory and your call for our lives. Lord, I pray that you'd give us a deeper level of understanding that this is not simply a duty or a set of rules or regulations, but this is the privilege we have to proclaim the gospel, the privilege we have to declare the holiness of God. 
So Lord, I pray that you would minister to us today. And we pray this all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You are God in heaven. 
place today, Lord, you'd give us the, the joy, the privilege, the understanding to proclaim the gospel wherever we go. Lord, I pray that you would use us to be set apart, to be holy. Lord, I thank you for our, every one of our church family, Lord, as we leave this place. Bring glory to your name. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So thank you for coming this morning. Just a, a reminder, worship, watch, and wait will be tonight at 6 o'clock. And, uh, and then also Friday night and Saturday morning. Friday night for the Women's Lift Ministry and Saturday morning. And look forward to seeing you at one of those for the men's breakfast on Saturday morning. So bless you. Have a great week.